Welcome to Behave Yourself, the podcast that aims to bring the science of human behavior and how you can apply it to your own life and become the happiest, healthiest, and most successful version of you. We're two behavior analysts with backgrounds in personal training and nutrition who struggled in the past with confidence, weight loss, breaking promises to ourselves, and constantly trying the quick fixes. We bring the science and show you how to apply it confidently and consistently towards your own goals and how to actually create a lifestyle change. Behavior analysis is the science of human behavior, and we all engage in behaviors that either move us towards the direction of our goals or hold us back from living the life we desire. I'm one of your hosts, Emily McRae. And I'm your other host, Joe Wesley. Hey, Joe, how have you been behaving yourself this week? Hello. Um, I have been behaving myself well in some areas. I've been very consistent in some of my behavior plans. Journaling is still on point. Um, I have not been behaving myself in other areas. So I have sat down and evaluated those this weekend and have some new behavior plans in place. So very well behaved in some areas, not so well behaved in other areas. How have you been behaving yourself? I have been working on increasing my veggies that I eat and working on keeping consistent with that. I too have been not so consistent with other behaviors that I am trying to work on in terms of some business building strategies. So I've got some plans in place for that as well this week. Nice. And as I was just, as I was just saying, not being consistent with not eating dairy. So if you hear me clear my throat throughout this podcast, very sorry. I'm going to get consistent on that this week. (laughs) (laughs) Some consequences of the behaviors. Exactly. Uh, Not (laughs) ideal. Okay. So today we were going to talk about how not to fail in fall or how to be awesome in autumn, depending on where you're coming from. Um, So I thought it'd be helpful for us to first chat about why fall or why autumn can be a bit of a challenge each year, because Sure enough, it comes around every 12 months and sure enough, we struggle every 12 months. So what do you find the hardest thing about um, being consistent with your health and fitness and general consistency in autumn or fall? Or fall. (laughs) So for me personally, I've found that it's the colder weather and we end up less exercise and motivation to do that because of the cold and we want to snuggle under a blanket and that's a lot more enjoyable and avoiding kind of that pain of the cold weather and not being outside as much unless you're, you know, going to pick pumpkins or apples. It's that those daily walks are starting to dwindle and that cold weather is coming in and approaching and we're kind of getting ready for that hibernation phase of the the year and the the weather and everything. So what do you what do you kind of struggle with? Yeah, similarly, oh, no. and I think um, I think psychologists would call it sad or seasonal affective disorder. And I I'm very aware of my mindset, but it's it is the case that you know walking to work in bright sunshine in summer, or walking to work in the pouring rain and it's grey and cold outside, it does just affect your how you feel that day. And I wish it didn't, and I'm working on it not affecting me so much. But yeah, definitely the colder days and the darker mornings and darker nights is something that I don't love Mm, yeah for sure um I suppose in this kind of weather less keen to come home and for dinner eat a salad so looking for more of that warm and maybe stodgy higher carb foods oh for sure I'm the same and I think we could even do a full episode on how to kind of find these easy, simple meals that are still full of good winter vegetables and simple recipes. I know chili in the crock pot or stew is a really big one, but easy to make a little healthier when we kind of want that warm comfort food, but it is, you're not as inclined to eat a cold salad and have all those summer fruits and different things that we kind of are more inclined to eat in the, in the warmer months of summer. And then also... replacing everything with cauliflower does not work. <laughs> it doesn't? <laughs> no. <laughs> cauliflower pizza, cauliflower everything. It's not the same. Just no. smells like that. Okay. We're going to have to work on some simple, simple recipes. I've got spaghetti squash down this week. So, you know, I've never been my... able to find that in the UK. Interesting. I see it all over American kind of food sites, but they just don't sell it here. I don't know why. Interesting. 
Maybe I can mail you some spaghetti squash. and <laughs> be a heavy quite package. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite easy. I must say it's probably the easiest thing that I've made so far. So it looks delicious. It is. It is. And it's, it's veggies. It's, but it tastes like, tastes like in, in some regards, spaghetti. I'm sure if I went to one of the <clears throat> four Whole Foods around London and spent 20 pounds on it, I could probably find one, but not willing to do that. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> not yeah. that good. So we have some holidays coming up too that also around food tend to be a challenge as well for many people. Mm-hmm. And what do you guys have over in the UK for major holidays that are coming up towards the end of the year? Yeah, we were talking about this last week a little, weren't we? Obviously, mm-hmm. we do have Halloween. Is it a major holiday? No, I don't think so. I think, do you guys call it a Hallmark holiday? Like it's it's been made into holiday by oh, companies oh, yeah. so that they can sell you a lot of stuff. So there's in the shops at the moment, there are <clears throat> pumpkin sweets and, <clears throat> excuse me, like chocolates in the shape of sweets or mm-hmm. outfits for the kids to buy. Um, but it's only been the last couple of years that people, in inverted commas, celebrate it. Um so yeah, I guess we have Halloween, but not really. Um, we have the 5th of November, which is Bonfire Night or Guy Fawkes Night, where we celebrate when a bunch of criminals try to blow up the Houses of Parliament. And we do that by having lots of fireworks. Um, but typically with the fireworks night, we also have um, sausages and soup and baked potatoes and sweeties and candy floss and toffee apples and lots of good food, lots of calorie dense food around that. Mm. Um, we don't have Thanksgiving and then I guess the next big one would be Christmas which over here seems to last for three months <laughs> and certainly the eating around Christmas lasts for three months <laughs> I think we have had like Christmas things come out in September here where it's starting earlier and earlier that all of those kind of marketing and things to buy starts even earlier but the whole October to January 1st ends up being kind of this eating festivities celebrations yeah. for three months and just keep, keeps going on. And people start to kind of set their nutrition goals for the first of the year because it's hard to, to get through those, those holidays and, yeah. and stay on track with goals. That's one of my biggest bugbears. And we'll come on to that later, I guess, but the idea of it's they're in the shops and I must have those things now so even though it's only October I'm already eating Christmas food no (laughs) let's not do that (laughs) and for me as well since going from summer to September um in the summertime I am not in schools because the kids are on summer break and so I am very much more on my own schedule and whereas now I'm back in schools um things are a lot busier this day starts a lot earlier I'm going into school staff rooms where there's lots of this kind of treat food available because people bring it in for teacher appreciation um and yeah I'm just out the house a lot earlier and back home a lot later than I ever have been and I guess people with kids are probably feeling the same way now that schools are back in session oh for sure and with schools being back in session parents may be back working and schedules get more chaotic and that time for yourself, especially over here right now with COVID, it's everything's picking up a little bit more in terms of schedules and going into the office for many and that being at home and having kind of control over the schedule has quickly shifted away and preparing for that change in a schedule, whenever it may be in any part of life, if something's changing within the schedule, getting prepared for that and really setting up some plan in place for when that schedule changes and how you can stay on track with your goals, even when that shift in life changes, you are in control of it. Yeah, I agreed. Um, I don't know about you, but with the change in weather and schools at the moment are freezing they all have the policy that because of coronavirus they have to keep all of the windows and doors open all the time Mm. they're so cold and so I am wearing all of the jumpers and long sleeve vests underneath the jumpers and everyone must have thought I've put on 50 pounds in the last two (laughs) weeks I have got a few pounds but I haven't put on 50 pounds but yeah wearing a lot of big chunky sweaters and and clothes so um 
I guess I don't like the idea of people working towards a summer body or a beach body. But now that the weather is cooler and people aren't wearing such skimpy clothing, maybe their focus around weight loss or weight maintenance would be less focused because just get to cover it up with a nice baggy jumper. Oh yeah. I have a huge baggy sweater that goes down to my thighs right now and it's, <laughs> it could cover up anything and you wouldn't know. And for sure, it's very easy to just kind of put some layers on and nobody's going to see you or you're, it's cold and you're not going anywhere and putting on a swimsuit. And so that motivation kind of has started to decrease. And so it's, it's, looking at reframing those goals and saying, okay, what are, what's still important to me, even though I can put on a baggy sweater, am I confident or am I putting this on to just kind of hide behind? Yeah. I like that. Are you you putting it on because you want to, or are you putting it on to cover up other things? I'm genuinely putting it on because I'm freezing, (laughs) but there is the added benefit of it being very cozy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And then in terms of going into this winter too, you know, it's very easy to catch a cold and feel congested even just at its basic level and not having that energy to work out or potentially using it as an excuse. I don't know about you, but when I've got a congested nose, I don't want to bend over and do even yoga. It's hard to not have that clear oxygen intake and it makes you tired and maybe that motivation for working out decreases, but sometimes exercise can help and movement can help the body start to heal and avoid having a cold or avoid getting sick because you're building up that immune system through nutrition, through exercise, movement, and staying healthy, especially during this time when we really need to build up our immune system. So what's that like for you in the winter with kind of feeling ill maybe and do you tend to stay away from exercise if you're not feeling well? No, I, this is completely non-behavior analytic and you're going to call me a hippie and tell me I'm terrible. You won't, you're lovely, but I, (laughs) I, um, I'm big on the mindset thing. And so I think if we tell ourselves it's winter and therefore I'll get ill, you will get ill. It's almost a Mm -hmm. self-fulfilling prophecy. And so, and I don't think your brain necessarily hears the word not. So I wouldn't say like, I don't get it. I just like, I have an amazing immune system. And genuinely I do. Like I go into 10 different schools in a week with snotty children around. (laughs) I'm healthy. I haven't had Mm -hmm. a cold for two years. Um, And a lot of the kids that we work with do tend to be quite immunocompromised. I'm glad I got that word out. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to go well. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of the kids I work with are sick children, um, but I don't catch what they have. So do I start exercise when I'm ill? Um, I had a doctor explain to me once that if it is um, neck up, then you, um, let me get this right. Where the, where the illness is, if it's neck up, then you should work out. But if it's neck down, mm-hmm. then you shouldn't work out. I might have got that wrong and it might be the the other way, but I think essentially if it's just a head cold, then you can totally work out and it helps the kind of airways get things through. Um, So yeah, I still work out when I have a cold or a cough on the Mm -hmm. small occasion I do. If I'm injured, like I am now, (laughs) no, I sometimes do yoga if it feels good, but stop until I'm better. How about you? I think it's a big it is a big thing with mindset and mindset is a huge part of how we're approaching all of our goals and what our, what our mindset is like, what we're telling ourselves. And it's this balance of listening to your body or thinking that you're listening to your body and just using that as an excuse to not exercise Mm -hmm. and saying, Oh, well, I'm listening to my body. I don't feel good for you. You're listening to your body because we're not going to play around with a significant injury. And so you're just doing what feels good. And when it doesn't feel good, stopping. But many people say, oh, well, I'm listening to my body. I'm tired. I'm not going to work out. And sometimes that that movement will really get you into that higher energy state. And for some people, if you are exhausted because you haven't slept because you have an infant, do five minutes and then be done and recognize too that you are going through a certain phase of life that is taking a lot of your energy and your body does need sleep to repair and rest, but it's really kind of 
listening, but with that balance and knowing what your goals are and are you actually being honest with yourself and saying, can I do this or am I using this as an excuse? Definitely. And then reframing what you can do, having a can do approach about it. Like I can't lift weights at the moment. My neck and shoulder are not happy with me but I can get on the exercise bike and I can go for walks and I can't, mm-hmm. there's lots of things I can do. I'm not going to use it as an excuse to sit on my bum for the next month whilst it heals. Right. It's like my foot. I can do upper body. It's just my foot that I really can't do anything right now with. And <laughs> ne- not to say that I couldn't, I could, but it would produce more pain, but I can still I have a whole rest of my body. I have core, I have upper body, all of that, that I can still work on and do and not be idle for the time that it takes to heal and recognizing that you're still capable of doing some sort of movement, whatever that may be. Yeah. You've been really good at that. I'm sorry. I wasn't laughing at you having a no. sore foot. I was laughing at the fact that we are here with a health and fitness podcast, but both <laughs> completely injured and not working out. We're normally really healthy. I promise. But I think it, I think it, it goes to show, you know, it's, it's not that we're not immune, but you know, it, it, this superhuman, we're fine all the time, or we're working out all the time. It's that we also are experiencing aches and pains or twinges or injuries and how we're working through those and how we're approaching them and saying, okay, well, this is still what my goal is. This is still, I'm still staying active in a way that is helpful for me, my mental health, staying consistent with what I've set out to do and committed to myself and promised to myself is staying active. And that's, that's important to both of us. And I think this leads nicely into how to set goals based on our values and what we really want to accomplish and how we can really utilize that to stay on track, even when things like an unexpected injury comes up or eight weeks of an injury happens and it's not what we expected. And how do we set these goals that are based on our values and what we really want to achieve. Yeah, agreed. Um, I, on my daily walk, came up with a good idea, which I'm going to try on you now. I haven't told you I'm going to do this, so I hope it's okay. How many times have you gotten to, you personally, Emily, how many times have you gotten to the 1st of January and just felt a bit crummy and like you need a whole life overhaul to get back on track? For years, I did that. I think maybe this first of the year of 2020, I set out with actual actionable goals and was going into it a little bit better than many years past. But for years, just was ready to totally revamp my life and become this whole new person with grandiose goals that I was never probably going to hit because I didn't have a plan either. And I think, you know, that's that's the biggest challenge that many of us face is we set these huge goals for a year and not actually sticking to them is pretty pretty common totally and I think a lot of us do it because we get through the festive period we get through autumn and winter and we get to January and suddenly go oh crumbs I've completely gone off track for the last three months and now look where I am and I feel terrible and I look probably not my best Mm -hmm. Um, but we spent the whole of those three months just mindlessly doing whatever we're doing however and another thought experiment can you tell me one of your favorite Christmas memories or your favorite Halloween memories I'm gonna go with a Thanksgiving memory because that's my favorite holiday so my favorite Thanksgiving was actually my 25th birthday and it was So my birthday landed on Thanksgiving. It was my 25th birthday and my now husband proposed to me that morning as well. So it's a very memorable day, but it was a lot of celebration, a lot of pie. I love pie and everything. So that, that is probably my most favorite holiday memory. That's a good one. (laughs) On that day, your favorite favorite memories, you remember the pie, you remember the proposal, amazing, it was your birthday. What did you weigh that day? I have no idea. Exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting then, isn't it? So we remember, it's important that we remember the memories and there are so many memories to be made in this period. 
there's also a lot of goal undoing to be done during this period so what I was mindful of is I didn't want this podcast to be just about how to maintain your weight because as we said before it's a really crummy goal to have just if you're the only thing you're good at in life is maintaining your weight you're gonna have quite a miserable life so it's really important to be present at the festivities and the values and goals that you set for this time to yes be health focused so that come the 1st of January you're not ready to throw in the towel and start afresh as a new person but you also build memories and you're not turning up to your family Christmas with a Tupperware full of salad because that's really sad Mm -hmm. (laughs) so having that balance of having goals that are both um health focused but also focused on other things like how to be present at festivities I love that. And I think too, a lot of festivities come with taking pictures with family members, cousins, relatives. And I know many people who are looking back at photos like that and picking themselves apart or not even getting in the photos. I know so many moms out there and they don't even get in the photos because they don't like how they look, but then they're not able to create these memories with their kids to look back on. And it's, it, it breaks my heart because your kids aren't worrying about what you look like. They just want to have a picture with you. And we're limiting ourselves from these memories by being so conscious about what we're eating and how we weigh and how we look and how we're being perceived. And it's, it's your family. They want, they want to just be with you and make those memories. So I love that point. I love that little experiment. If you went to say your three kind of closest people, the three people that love you the most and ask them maybe to write down what is it about Christmas that they love or what is it about you that they love? What do they value about you? What do they value about Thanksgiving? I promise you not a single one of them will value the fact that you are a certain weight. It just, it won't. So yeah, it wouldn't come across. It wouldn't be the thing that they ever would talk about or bring up. They want to have that time with you. And they want to have that time with you, with you feeling good, getting Mm -hmm. in the pictures. So I think we have to strike this balance between um, honoring your health goals, whatever they are, and they don't have to be weight focused, honoring your own goals and your own confidence and health goals, as well as all the other things like being present with family. I love that. I love it. I think too, you know, setting these goals and setting these intentions going into the holidays and knowing what are my primary goals? What are my intentions with this? My intention is to be present. My intention is to enjoy the food, but also my intention maybe to make sure I get more veggies than cheese and crackers. I'm the first one at the cheese and cracker plate, but not always the veggies. And so setting those intentions and being mindfully present as well with, you know, if you're setting goals, if you want to stay on track, but also be present and enjoy yourself, finding that specificity in when, when you go into a a gathering of not just going in to eat all the sweets and treats, but still being able to successfully stay on track and still be true to who you are and who you want to be and the goals that you've set for yourself. Yeah. And understanding you can't necessarily you cannot have it all or do it all sometimes so if you're going to prioritize family that year that's okay but we're also going to then need to accept that you'll gain a few pounds or you won't be able to stick to another goal that you might have but if you are going to try and take the stage in a bodybuilding contest on the 1st of January you're going to have to sacrifice some of the that kind of family traditions of making sugar cookies or whatever the family tradition is so almost putting in mind, excuse me, putting in mind now what the focus or what the most important priorities are. So I guess if we assume, because we're a podcast focusing on health and fitness, um, if we assume that the, that we do want to maintain our health goals, whatever they may be, I guess the first thing we're going to need to do moving into this season is take some baseline data. I love that. I love baseline data and it tells us where we're at. What is it for non-behavior analysts? What is baseline data? So for non-behavior analysts out there, baseline data is where you're at currently. Where are you? What is your behavior looking like maybe in the past five to seven days or past month? And maybe you haven't necessarily collected the data and tracked 
whatever it is that you're trying to work on. You can start doing it now. It's prior to when you're actually making the behavior change. It's what you're doing without any extra help, supports, and any intervention that you're putting in, small or big. It's it's what where you're at right now. And I tell my clients, it's okay. And you may not like your baseline data. And that's sometimes good. It's good to not like your baseline data because you're want, going to want to improve from there. It's sometimes facing the music too. And it's a reality check of, oh, this is where I'm at right now. And noticing that as well and being aware of where you're currently at with your goals. And if you've been truly honest with yourself and sticking to them. Yeah. And so in reality, what that might look like for health and fitness goals, it might be the number of minutes of exercise done per week. And that would, you take baseline data from that. It might be, you might take photos of the plates of food that you eat uh, for a week. And so you've got some baseline data of what kinds of food or what quantities of food you're eating, how many servings of fruit or vegetables you manage to eat per day or per week. And you would just simply note it down and if you want to get fancy put it into an excel tracker um and just take some number based kind of um data on whatever goals you are that you're going to be focused on i love it Mm. and it will it will start to for many people it will start to slowly shift that behavior without anything being put in place just being aware of it you may be less likely to eat that second or third cookie if you know that you're writing it down and tracking it and so it starts to slowly shift that behavior slightly it does yeah and I think sometimes people are reticent like you were saying to note down their baseline data because they're embarrassed of it Mm -hmm. speaking as someone that's taken themselves from obese to a healthy weight you're you're going you're going to wish that you took really accurate baseline data when you're on the other side of it because to compare it is so very cool um, and I wish I had more photos of myself when I was obese, but I hid from the camera because I hated how I looked. So I don't mm-hmm. always take the baseline data. Yeah. I think another way to take baseline data that's not fully numerical, but it it's putting on a, an article of clothing that you used to wear and loved or that you want to be able to wear and feel confident in. And maybe it's tight in certain places or you're just not feeling confident in that piece of clothing. Take take a picture in it or take a picture of it if you're not there yet and use that. And it's just, it's not this, it's not a numbers based thing. And we want all these numbers. We want this data, but that is also data. It's not, you know, your current, it's not a behavior. It's not something you're going to change, but you're going to see the consequences of your behaviors allow you to be able to feel confident in that clothing that you want to be able to wear. So, yeah, definitely. Awesome. So what are some strategies that you use going into festivities, Joe? Uh, As you can expect from me, I've made notes. So um, I've Mm -hmm. kind of made nutrition based um, notes. So for me, a big one is crowding out the potential. um, I don't want to call them bad foods. We need to come up with a better word for this. Mm. Foods aren't bad. Foods aren't good foods that don't fit my goals. So to not want to eat the foods that don't fit my goals when I'm in the staff room at school and there's loads of sweets or cakes or whatever, or when I'm at the family party and there's loads of um, treat food, by crowding out, by making sure that I'm eating lots of the other stuff. So um, eating plenty of protein, not letting myself get too hungry, making sure that I eat plenty of vegetables. Maybe before I go to a party, I'd have a really big plate of food filled with vegetables and lean protein. And then I'm less tempted to eat all the food when I get to the party. Um, It's sometimes really tempting to think, oh, well, I'll save calories by not eating before I go to the party. But then, as you say, you just end up in front of the cheese and cracker plate, um, which is not ideal. And that can sometimes lead, I think, particularly in this season into um, like a binge restrict cycle where you think, oh, I've eaten too much at one party. So now I need to restrict my calories on another day. But then you end up binging again. And it's called... um, zigzagging your calories and um as a one-off strategy like if you know you've got a big party at the weekend or you know you've got christmas day coming up having a few fewer calories throughout the week to then allow for the fact that you'll be eating a lot more calories on one day as a one-off strategy if you're very aware of your calories and macros 
it can be a really good thing to do because it means that your calories overall for the whole week may be the same as a standard week but as a life strategy zigzagging or binge restricting is actually really damaging and can be really damaging to your health but also your mental health so yeah making sure that I don't do that and that I eat plenty of the good stuff um so that I'm not tempted to binge on the bad stuff is definitely one um like I just said planning some of the treats into my calories and into my macros so if I know that my mum my mum makes a pecan pie that is just heaven um planning that into my day um that's a, something she makes at Christmas. Actually, at Christmas, there's loads of really healthy, low calorie, low fat foods that are fantastic. Turkey is one mm. of the leanest meats you can buy. Sorry, vegetarians. Um, <laughs> but filling my plate with like vegetables and turkey rather than potatoes and stuffing and cranberry sauce. So but planning that then the treat I want to have that day is not the stuffing and potatoes. The treat I want is my mum's pie. Um, so that's another one. Um, identifying my food triggers. Um, there are certain foods that I think because I have a history of binge eating, there are certain foods that just flick my switch and I really struggle to control my eating around them. I find it a lot easier if I have done what I've just said. So eat lots of protein, eat lots of other good foods. Um, but identifying them almost is half the battle. And once you've identified them, knowing strategies around how you can eat those so for example um chocolate is a big trigger food for me I can eat handfuls and handfuls and handfuls of it but I know that so um portioning it portioning out what I want to eat of that particular chocolate item knowing that that is what I'm having for the day and I cannot go back to the box or the tin or wherever it's come from to get more um eating it with other people as a sociable event, not done in private because mm. very few people will binge eat in public. It will be done privately. Mm. Um, and then there's that kind of sense of, are you building memories around the food because you're sharing chocolates at a social event or is it is it connected with shame and binge eating? Um, so identifying those food triggers and then having some kind of plan around it. Are you going to indulge and plan it into your calories or are you just not going to indulge and enjoy other foods? Um, and then identifying foods that you do want to eat in the season, like turkey, like fruit or vegetables or whatever it might be, um, and try and plan it into your day. If it means that you're the person that takes a fruit platter to a party, then you're the person that takes a fruit platter. And actually, mm -hmm. in this day and age, I think people prefer that. Like, I, sometimes I turn up to friends' houses and you see other people arrive with, like, huge bundles of sweets or candy or cakes, and you kind of see the host face like oh God, we're going to be eating this for a week. Like, what am I going to do with all this bad food? Not bad food, calorific food. Mm. I think people appreciate when you bring the vegetable platter or the fruit platter or whatever it might be. So oh. I think those are all, were all my kind of nutrition-based antecedent strategies I had. I love it. Any ideas? I, I have one more nutrition thing and then I'll kind of go into the movement kind of strategies too. But I had all of my clients take pictures of your, it typically ends up with appetizers. I mean, the main meal tends to be, you know, a lot of mashed potatoes and stuffing and gravy, but the appetizers and the snacks that everyone's standing around and chatting around those meals. I know at our family events, it, that, that's where everybody stands is the cheese and crackers, the veggies, the dips. And there's sometimes these little plates <laughs> that not everybody uses and taking what you want and putting it on your little plate, your little appetizer plate and take a picture of it because it's so easy to mindlessly eat when you're talking and chatting and having all these people around and you're just eating chips and dip and cheese and crackers and you have no idea how many you've actually eaten and to keep count is not a logical thing either if you want to be present with your family but fill up your plate take a picture of it and then eat enjoy and talk and you have this what we call a permanent product that you can look at after and reflect and say okay what decisions did I make did I take more veggies on that plate did I fill it up nice and full of good good in quotes choices or did I kind of indulge in things that I don't necessarily 
enjoy or it's, it doesn't sit well with my body. Some of us know dairy doesn't sit well with us or gluten. And we may indulge in these in parties because it's, it's a social event versus not. And so taking pictures of your plates of food so that, you know, after, and even if you're, you're not making, you know, the choices that you want to be making, you still are aware of them and you still have this awareness of what you're putting on your plate. And my clients sent their pictures to me during those days just to stay attract, stay accountable and on track to their goals and to what they really set out to do during those holiday seasons. I love that. And even having a plate, so not just walking past the crisp bowl and endlessly. Mm. Yeah, perfect. Chip bowl, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love that. And so then mm-hmm. that's kind of the things that we might do as an antecedent strategy, which I simply put is just the things that you would do beforehand to try and control the behaviors in the moment. Mm-hmm. Did you have any movement antecedent strategies? I do. So we tend to see a lot of people exercise to earn their food. Oh, I have to work out before I go so that I can eat more food at the party. And we tend to think of this as we have to earn, earn the food that we're eating. And it's, it's such a mindset that is so harmful to many of us to have that, that mindset of we have to earn what we're eating, but movement beforehand can put you in this mindset of, I am an active, healthy person. I make healthy choices for myself. And if you went and did the Turkey Trot 5k, or you even just did your small little workout is that at a home, thing? <laughs> It is. It is. Oh my gosh. It's so funny that <laughs> I things that I don't even think about for you. So typically in the U S on Thanksgiving morning, many towns host 5k road races. And I'm sure this year will be there a lot of virtual. Please races. tell me you dress up as turkeys. I don't, um, <laughs> but I, a lot of people get the turkey leg yeah. hats and <laughs> It's usually freezing cold, so I don't know why we do it, but we do it. And there's there's Santa 5Ks and not typically on Halloween, but there's a few Halloween 5Ks or because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, there's those. But people tend to do these and then think to earn them. But mm. what if you switch that mindset and said, okay, I'm going to get up and do something really healthy for myself and set myself in the mindset of I did a 5K this morning and or walked a 5K and now I'm going to make healthy choices because I've already made that one healthy choice and it can lead to more choices versus sitting on the couch. And don't get me wrong. I love the Macy's Thanksgiving day parade in the U S big giant balloons that don't serve any purpose, but I grew up watching it. And yes, sitting on the couch is enjoyable making those memories. But what if you put yourself in that mindset of getting a workout in staying active, and then you can kind of use it as this, maybe bragging ability when you get to whatever festive you're at and you say, Oh, I, you know, I worked out this morning and people are honestly going to be impressed because it's not this normal thing for people to do before a party is to get a good workout in and take Mm. care of your health and be focused on it. So take pride in that and keep that mindset of, I am a healthy person. I make healthy choices for myself, no matter what day of the year it is your health is still, if it's important to you, it's important on those days as well Hmm. and staying consistent with that. And it doesn't have to be a 5k. It could be a 10 minute workout and that's it. And that's okay too. And it's just getting in that mindset the morning of is a really helpful way to be active and get your body moving. And typically at family parties, it's standing around and sitting around and watching sports and, it's not active. So get in that, those steps and that activity beforehand Mm. just to get your body moving. I like that. And if you, I don't know if it's a thing there, but over here, there's the Christmas day walk after kind of Christmas lunch, every family goes for a walk and you bump into other families and say hi. And actually from a nutrition point of view, it's really good for your digestion after a meal Mm. to go for a walk. It's kind of aids the digestive process. So that's great and if you can make that a family tradition then um we didn't grow up being particularly active or healthy but my brother happened to marry someone who is very active and loves a good walk and I am now more active so it has now become a tradition that we go for family walks and we probably do two a day over Christmas the Christmas period and I guess just to touch on your point of you don't have to earn your food I think um and this is a whole other podcast in itself but the body positivity movement um 
has really gone hell for leather on the concept of you don't have to earn your food, um, you're allowed to eat whatever you want, and you don't have to exercise to make up for it. All of that is true. You can eat whatever you like, you're a grown up. But let's just put here and now, if you eat a lot of calorific foods, high calorie foods, and you don't expend that energy with exercise or other things, you will put on weight and it won't be other weight, it will be fat weight, because that is what science tells us. And that's totally cool. If that's what you, if, if your goal is not weight maintenance or fat maintenance or fat loss, cool, please yourself. Mm. But don't kid yourself that because the body positivity movement is telling you it's okay to eat all the cake, that you can then wake up on January the 1st and still feel your best and have maintained any fat loss you've previously had. You can't. Yeah. I would drop the mic, oh. but I just spent a hundred pounds on it. So I'm not going to be dropping them. <laughs> it's the hard truth and it is. And you have to face that music and say, what, what is my goal here? And, you know, if, if your goal is weight loss, then you have to be very real with yourself. And it's, again, it's not to say that you can't have the two slices of cake and not it's you you don't have to feel that guilt and shame around it but also know what strategies moving forward you need to use to continue to hit your goals and it's also that and we'll talk about this in a minute but that after the fact of having to work it off too yeah of that mindset there's a difference between knowing the science and this really kind of unhealth unhealthy mindset that goes into food and workout kind of relationship. So let's talk about in the moment when we're at these parties, what can we kind of do to stay on track with our goals? So what are some of your recommendations, Joe, for when we're at a party and we need to stay on track with our goals, but maybe those triggers are coming into play and we need to make some decisions in the moment? Yeah, I like it. So often I've kind of as far as possible, I am a control freak. I've planned out ahead. Um, I'll know roughly what's being served. I really like cooking and hosting. So often I've been the cook and I've been the host. So I know exactly what food's going to be there. But let's say I'm not and I haven't been able to plan. The first thing is to enjoy the actual moment. It's very rare that you have a party or a holiday kind of gathering where the only focus is food. Often you're meeting family and friends because you want to spend time with them and you want to see how they're doing and make memories with them. So focusing on that above and beyond the food, which I find a lot easier if I've already, if I'm feeling satiated by the time I've arrived. So if I arrive at a party really hungry, all I'm going to be thinking is, oh my God, when's the food coming out? Um, but I can focus a lot more on having good conversation with people that I love if I'm not focused on the food. So focusing on the important things, um, such as, you know, getting to know what people have been up to and making them feel loved by my kind of questioning and conversation skills, rather than just panicking about when the pie is coming out. Um, there's a CBT or cognitive behavior therapy grounding technique, which I really like, and it's getting people um, to, they have to note down after the fact, the food that you ate, what did it smell like? What did it taste like? What did it feel like? What were some of the textures? Can you kind of give me 10 adjectives about that food? And if you're eating it mindfully, so slowly, not binge eating it, but really enjoying it and appreciating it for what it is, you should be able to tell me all of those things. And if you can't, you were probably eating it mindlessly, maybe even binge eating it. Um, I know from binge eating episodes in the past, I don't even know where the last 10 minutes have gone. It's almost like I wake up and like all the cookies have gone. But if you're eating mindfully, being able to do all of those things. So when the food comes out, already starting to think, oh, it looks like this. I can smell it. It smells like this. And already thinking of the adjectives. And you'll probably enjoy the food a whole lot more for doing that. Um, there's a really nice um, experiment and I wish I could remember who came up with it. I can't. I'll think of it for next week where you take a treat food like a donut or a cookie and put a timer on for 10 minutes 
and you have to spend 10 minutes eating it. So eat just one small donut or one small cookie. And you start off by kind of putting it near your mouth and smelling it and then having one crumb. And you take this time to really like appreciate it. And by the time you've eaten just one single cookie or one single cupcake or whatever, you're so much more satiated from eating it because you've really appreciated everything about it. So taking the time in that moment to really appreciate the food that you are um, eating. If you have lots of choices of food, say you're at a buffet, do you guys call them buffets? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you're at a buffet and you've got lots of different choices. Maybe you've had your plate of food, like Emily suggested, you've taken the <clears throat> picture of the food and then you could go back for more and you don't necessarily need to go back for more, but there's lots of good food on offer. Maybe you should go back to more for more. Um, or maybe you're in the staff room and there's lots of um, goodies available there's the other idea of having what we call delay, distract, decide. So identify what it is that you're wanting. I know, for example, in the staff room, there is there are mince pies um, or I know in the staff room, there's Halloween cookies. OK, I'm going to set a timer on my phone. I'm going to have a really big drink of water. I'm going to distract myself with something else. And if I still want it after 10 minutes, I can totally go and have it. But by having this delay, distract, decide gives you that 10 minutes to... Is it just a craving or do you actually really want it? Um, are you just bored? Are you just thirsty? And so by the time you've done all of those things, if you still want it after 10 minutes, great, go and eat it. But it means that you're not just going to mindlessly be, I think I should get a pound every time I say mindless on this podcast. What do you think? <laughs> you should. <laughs> it's going to make sure that you're not just going to be mindlessly eating it. And then if you do eat it, as I say, just really enjoy it and enjoy the memory, enjoy the experience and make it worthwhile. Food's great. It is. It's good. Awesome. Yeah. How about you? All right. So for me, it's definitely the water is a big one that I use. And it. I love the delay. Distract. Distract aside. I love that. I love it's such a simple method that we can implement wherever we are. We all have watches and phones and things on us to be able to do that. And I love that strategy. And I, again, it's, it's simple to implement and we can do it anywhere. And the other thing that I use typically during holidays and festivities or in the break room, you know, where there, where there's all the cookies and everything is, do I actually want this or am I just taking it because it's here? Do I actually enjoy the really awful frosting from the grocery store on these cupcakes that are really not that great? Or do I really love this homemade pie or these homemade sticky buns that if any of my husband's family is listening to this, the most amazing sticky buns in the world? Yes, because they're homemade and because it's come from a place of love. And I know that I'm going to have that at every holiday party. And, you know, is it, is it something that you're just having because everyone else is having or because it's there or because you truly want it and you know, you're going to enjoy it. And afterwards the guilt is not going to be there that, Oh, I didn't really want that. I just ate it because it was there. And it's that blackout. It's that mindlessly eating and you don't even realize that you're doing it. And it's a very real thing that many of us are struggling with is that it, you eat it and you didn't even realize you ate it and then you don't want to own up to it either. And totally. it's Interesting all in private. Point that you bring up about your husband's um, family, sticky buns. And I mentioned my mom's pie earlier. Mm -hmm. I guess something else to mention is you don't owe anyone else your mouth. So if mm. like my mom is a terrible feeder, I come from a long line of kind of Jewish families where we are feeders. I'm a feeder too. You don't owe anyone else your mouth. So even if someone is trying to pressure you into eating something because they've made it for you with love, it's good to often come up with phrases that won't offend and phrases that will help in the moment that you can say in these moments, because I know my family mm. feeders. And nowadays they're much better. They know that I won't. And if they want to enter into discussion with me about why I won't eat for their benefit, then I'm happy to have that discussion. But it could be something like, oh, I'm not fancying that right now. Can I take one home for later? Or I so appreciate you made that for me. Um, I just don't fancy one right now. Um, but coming up with a phrase that 
is caring and kind, but you don't owe anyone else your mouth. You don't have to eat because someone's pressuring you to. Same with alcohol. You don't have to drink just because someone's pressuring you to. I love that. I love that because I think many people do get into those situations where somebody made them something and it's, it's not a requirement that you accept it. And if they are, if you're worried about the a relationship being strained because of that, it's maybe reevaluating kind of what that relationship looks like for you. And if they're really supporting you and your goals and your values and what you value in terms of your health and do they want you really to stick to your, what you've set out for your goals. I've set this goal for myself and I really would like to stay to it. I, again, I really appreciate you made that for me, but right now it's, I would, I, I don't want it right now or it's not I love that you say I don't fancy it right now. That sounds so much better. I wish we said things like that normally here, but it's, it's that kindness, but also standing your ground and sticking up for you and your values and your goals of what you actually do want to eat. Hmm. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. The more people know that you are that kind of person that eats that kind of way. And the same with yourself, the more you do it to yourself, willpower is a muscle, like it's a saying, it's not, but the more you do it, the more you'll trust yourself to um, pick behaviors that are goal focused. And the more you do it with other people, the more they know that you are, you have your own mind and you can't be coerced into eating things or drinking things that you don't want to eat or drink. So practice makes perfect. Yes. Okay. And then afterwards, consequence strategy. So after the party, after the moment, after the eating or the drinking or whatnot, um, not just your hangover cures. Any ideas? So like we kind of touched on earlier, not punishing yourself for mm-hmm. what you've eaten by exercising excessively more than normal or going in with that mindset. Just go in with your continuing to exercise because that was your goal in the first place of bringing more movement. And again, we've kind of said mindset a lot in this, but it really does play a huge, huge role in how we're approaching food, nutrition, exercise, and going into it with, I I ate and I enjoyed myself. And now I'm just continuing on with my goals of working out three days a week and getting in 10,000 steps. You're just continuing on with your goals. That was a day. It was enjoyable. You made the memories. Now continue on with your goals. It's not this long drawn out. You have to fix or make up for or anything in that kind of mindset or verbal phrasing aspect. So just continue on with what your goals were before the holiday came. What, what are your goals right now? You just, you get up and you work out on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Cool. If it's Monday after the holidays, get up, do your workout, stick to your same plan you were doing and continue on, do your 30 minute workout. It doesn't have to be this extensively long makeup for what you ate that weekend. Perfect. Agreed. What about Um, you? Yeah. Um, the same, I think a hugely, um, freeing, thought or freeing bits of knowledge for people is realizing that your um kind of fat maintenance or fat loss or weight loss weight maintenance over time is not on a day-to-day basis and I think it's troublesome sometimes that we have this idea of daily um calorie intake for men and women that men should eat about 2,000 and women should eat about no 2,500 and women should eat 2,000 calories because it gives people this idea that we should eat day by day. And so if you've eaten, um, I don't know, 3000 calories on Christmas day, then, or I've eaten 3000 calories on Christmas dinner while the day's ruined, I might as well keep eating and eating all the binge foods now. And then you wake up the next day feeling probably more awful than you had to anyway. You can decide moment by moment. So you've finished the one plate of food. Now you get to decide again, do you keep eating or do you not keep eating? Or do you just get to choose veggies and protein or do you get to choose pie and ice cream so uh, as you say the next day waking up it's a new day and it happened so then if you are feeling up to it going for an extra walk to get a few more steps in or doing an extra workout if you weren't planning on working out not to make up for the food that you've eaten but because it's a it's a calorie balance over time so over a week or a month or years even it's not that 
um, I'm not saying this very coherently, how to say it better. If you've had one bad day, it's just one bad day. And the sooner you can just get back on track with what you're doing, the sooner you will just carry on as you were before. But don't punish yourself because that will just lead to more binging, restricting and thinking to yourself, oh, well, I've had a bad week. I might as well keep eating. I've had a bad month. Oh, well, screw it until the 1st of January. And that doesn't mm-hmm. help. No. Um, and yeah, like you said, just remembering the fun you had, remembering the things that aren't food based, looking at pictures, um, looking at all the fun things you did have, maybe reflecting on the food and your behaviors around the food the next day as well. So I ate the pie and remember all those tastes and textures. And sometimes that can be enjoyable as the pie itself. Um, mm-hmm. Remembering um, kind of your behavior around it and then planning again for next time. Was I able to eat that food mindfully or wasn't I? What can I learn for next time? What could I do differently next time if it didn't go so well for me? I love that. Hmm. I love it. Yeah, the, I think I've kind of given all my nutrition thoughts. Have you got any other nutritional movement thoughts? I think we've kind of touched on a lot. And I think mm-hmm. with that reflection to noticing when you make those decisions, maybe you did make that decision to go get a second plate. Okay. You did it again. It happened. What, what are your thoughts now? Did you, are you proud of that choice that you made? Are you happy and okay with that? Maybe you are awesome and you're okay with it and it's in line with your goals and your values. Great. But if you're not happy and you're kind of starting to beat yourself up over it or talk negatively to yourself, make a note of that really kind of journal or record yourself or something so that when you go into this next festivity or you go into the staff room again, read that note in your note in your phone or listen to that audio of yourself saying, Hey, future self, this is how you felt. Do you want to feel this again? Or do you want to make a choice more in line with what you want to achieve? So I think that reflection, but also using that in the future is really helpful. And it really does, like over the years with, you know, binging episodes I've had in the past, then reflecting the next day of what thoughts I was having going into it. And now I'm really good, (coughs) excuse me, I'm really good at being able to say, you're having an unsafe thought, Mm -hmm. therefore you want to eat all the cake, or you're having a panicked thought, therefore you want to eat all the cake. Mm -hmm. Um, And then being able to identify, I'm not going to feel less panicked or less or more safe after eating that food. So then to be able to find different strategies um, instead. I love that. Love it. Yeah. Cake is wonderful, but it doesn't help everything. (laughs) It does not. So coming into fall, coming into autumn, do you have any particular goals for this season? So my goals for the fall are to continue to improve in terms of movement and exercise and hopefully fingers crossed building back in some lower body strength. So continuing to stay active. I am one of those people who it gets cold and I get under a blanket and hibernate and that's all I want to do. And especially for triathlon, it tends to be our off season and off season is really meant for building up strength, but we tend to take it as this break and this time to not do anything. And then we get into the beginning of the season in the early spring and we're struggling and then I end up with injuries. So really being more mindful this off season of which we kind of had six months of off season due to COVID, but really staying mindful of my strength and exercise and building that back up to really hopefully being able to be on track to race next season. And in terms of nutrition, again, I am a vegetarian, but I am not fantastic at getting in as many vegetables and nutrients as I should. And as I could be doing, not even should, but I could be, I'm entirely capable of it. And it's just easy to, again, in the winter, not eat as many vegetables. And so really incorporating a lot more vegetables into my meals at every meal. And I do have my self-management plan going. And so really sticking to that is one of my goals. What about you? What are your goals for the season? I've just finished kind of a four-week behavior plan of um, trying to journal and meditate more, and I still really hate Mm -hmm. it. So I'm going to kind of sit back and reassess that plan. And um, I've also not been reading as much as I would like to, particularly personal development books or education books. So I think I might change it up for um, still keep the journaling, but maybe 
I was doing five, at least five minutes of journaling at least five days per week. I might change it to 15 minutes of reading a personal development book. And if I fancy it, also noting in my journal thoughts I've had and reflecting on what I've read, because then at least I'll get 15 minutes of reading done five times a week. Um, and I'm sure I'll end up doing way more than 15 minutes. But if I give myself a small ish target and 15 minutes of reading for me is nothing, then I'm more likely to hit it. So I have that. Um, I think I'll do that going forward. I have also put on a bit of weight recently um, and having lost all the weight from being obese to where I am now, I have a comfortable range that I sit between and I don't go above and I don't go below kind of some set points. And I'm currently at the higher end of it. Mm -hmm. So I am putting myself in a fat loss phase, which I think will for me be really good at this time of year because for all the reasons that we've just spent an hour listing mm -hmm. um it's a hard time of year to do it but I am nothing if not consistent and I'm quite good at being hard on myself and I think if I can do it in this time of year when it's cold and lots of treat food around I can do it at any time of year and I know I can I've done it before so um with my back and neck and not being able to lift weights and do as much exercise as I can do um, previously, I'll really be focusing on the nutrition side of things and um, it is just an energy balance. So if I can't get quite as many calories out with movements, it will be looking at very carefully calories in. I love it. Awesome. Super. Alrighty. I think that's us for the day. That's it. That's what we've got. I, I'm, I'm excited to go into the holidays now and be armed with a little bit more actionable steps and items. And I guess my three takeaways from today would be really savoring the food and tasting it, taking that time to eat it, the delay, distract and decide. Yeah. That's my new, new fancy way of approaching it, but simple. And the third one is continuing to stay active and being that active mindset of health and I am an active person and I choose to make healthy choices for my myself. Nice. I like it. Okay. So if anyone has any questions that you'd like us to answer, any topics that you'd like us to cover, um, anything like that, then you can find me on Instagram at the behavior lady. And remembering that I'm based in UK. So behavior is with a U. So at the behavior lady, you can find Emily at, at emily.a.mcrae. So send us um, any kind of thoughts or comments or questions that you have for us. Have I missed anything? So please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, we would be so grateful for a review. We're just starting to get this out there and we would love to get more people involved in making health decisions and behavior changes. Super. Wonderful. We'll Online. see you next week. Have a good week. <laughs>